All right, saints, so it is Sunday. It is June 10th, 2012. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 37. Our message is called Pulling Arrows. The subtitle is The If Men. Don't get too excited about uh, that screen. There's only a couple slides for you this morning, and there are things that I forgot to print in your bulletin. So uh, tell me when you're in Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. The justice of your cause like the noonday sun. When we read those first five verses of Psalm 37, a question comes up. Are we talking about something that is active or something that is passive? We can sit back and we can say, well, I trust the Lord. Well, how is your trust manifesting itself? This word trust in Hebrew is bata. And when we say it, you need to understand that it's an action verb. So when we say we trust, it's not just a warm inward feeling. One way to define it is confidence, it is safety, it is security, but you can't see it unless it's being displayed in an action. So when the Bible tells us, trust in the Lord and enjoy safe pastor, understand that when your life is showing faith, when your actions can be credited as righteousness because what provoked the action was your trust, that is safe pastor. You are safe when you are doing exactly what the Lord tells you to do. This means you can go to Mexico and face a man with an AK-47 and be perfectly safe, but sit in a pew surrounded by comfort surrounded by everything else, and not feel safe. Because in one place you're in the hand of God, and in the other you're refusing to get in the hand of God. Now it's possible that those two things are reversed as well. The hand of God in your life is specially revealed through His Word and through His voice to you. You cannot trust Him if you have not heard Him. So a good question, church, is what are you trusting in? Are you trusting in the words of a preacher? Are you trusting in the words of a, a doctrine or a denomination? Are you trusting in simply a warm feeling? Or is your trust in the Lord because He has confirmed His word to you in a way you can't deny? That's worth having. Mm. It is so worth having. That is the starting line, guys. It's when you come to a place where you need to hear from Him and you know it, and nothing else will do. You wouldn't accept anything other than from Him. And he meets you in that need. That's how this begins. My sheep know my voice. When he says, delight yourself in the, in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. This is another verb. It means happily, softly, pliably to delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, when you are praying, when you're thinking about him, when you're talking to him, you're not sitting there trying to impose your will on him. You've seen children do this, right? I know none of you have done it, but it's, Daddy, you... You want me to have that gun, don't you? Daddy, oh, we're, we're going to go play paintball, aren't we? It's the assumptive close. Well, we pray like that sometimes. We pray, oh, Father, we thank you, for we know that you have given me this job. When you're not sure he gave you that job. And so the second week on the job, and it's now hard, we're not sure whether it's from the devil or from the Lord. I would say that in our trust of him, we need to not be so self-confident that we can't be pliable to hear from him. A man's pride will get him into many troubles. Amen. We're confident that we heard from God until there's a trial, and then we say that God has changed his mind because we're too prideful to say we were wrong. i got to tell you, anybody who stretches forth in trust is going to be wrong often. Was Abraham wrong? Was Isaac wrong? Was Jacob wrong? Well, if they're the fathers of the faith, let's, let's just rest in the fact of you're not going to get it right. You will be credited with righteousness for your effort. Amen. How do you see effort, friends? See, our effort shows up in our actions. This next one is even more fun. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. When Hebrew wants to say the word commit, he says galal. And galal is the same word that you use to roll a big boulder. <laughs> Can you imagine, Charlie, you and I are stuck to move a stone? And man, we get down on the ground, 
We're pushing, one's high, one's low. Once that thing gets moving, it's galal. It's committed to its course. Once something that is hard to move is moving in a certain direction, this is when it says, commit your way to the Lord. We're going to trust that He'll speak to us. We're going to trust that He will show us. We're going to be pliable, giving up our dreams, dying to self, taking on His dream and His will for our life. And then once revealed, we're going to roll in the direction He's pushing us. And we're not going to swerve to the left or the right. This is the spirit of Psalm 37. So I wrote, is it passive or is it active? When we trust, delight, commit. There's another word there. Let us keep reading in the verse. It comes, let's start verse 7. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. It sounds like what Cassidy preached Wednesday is true. Fretting and fear are the enemies of trust. Whenever we begin to weigh the consequence of doing what God has told us to do, we've sinned already. We're only allowed to weigh the consequence of not doing what He told us to do. You understand, the Word already says that when we seek Him, He will reward us. It already says that. It already says without faith it's impossible to please Him. We do not need to sit and contemplate the cost of what it will cost us to follow Him. You already did that. That was back at the starting line. Unless, of course, you fail that test and you've never come to the starting line. But for those of us that are sold out, those that are ready to die for Him, not in some metaphorical sense, but in reality, ready to take a bullet, we've already crossed that line. Once you've decided that you will give your life, what's left to lose? We no longer sit and contemplate what it will cost me to do God's will. But you can look all around you and see what it costs you to not do His will. It could be that a family falls away from the Lord, but says that they're just, you know, hearing from God to go somewhere else. Of course, somewhere else turns into three more else's. And a year or two goes by. And then you look and you go, well, let's check the fruit of that decision. And you see marriages that are loveless. You see children that, for all intents and purposes, are, par are parentless. You see bad fruit. This is what the word repent is for. We go, my God. I was deceived. If you're a Christian and you can never look back at your life and go, I let deception in, you're probably not looking soberly enough at your life. But that's not the end of the story. The good news is the gospel is for those who are sinners, those who are errant in their ways, those who are humble enough to receive instruction. Psalm 25 says he instructs sinners in his way, not the righteous. Let me ask you, when Jesus showed up, who was he kindest to? Those who were obviously sinners or those who saw themselves as saints? We're in our best position, friends, when we can look soberly at our life and go, yeah, last year most of it was a mistake. You know, I hope that's not the case for you. Maybe you can look and go, I had 50 good weeks, and these two I wish I could do again, and I can't, so I'm going to do them different next time. I hope that that's the case. But if we can't look back and see that we're changing our mind, deception's being stripped away, then how pliable are you in the presence of the Lord? Or are we just dictating to the Lord what we know His will must be? Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger. Turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. For evil men will be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. You hear that word, inherit the land? Those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Does that have a certain Matthew 5, 5 ring to it? Mm. Come on, Bible scholars, what's Matthew 5, 5? The meek will inherit? Yeah. The earth. Those who hope in the Lord will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. The 11th verse of, of this psalm also says the meek will inherit the earth. Well, which is it? Is it the meek or those who hope in the Lord? Or is it both? What is it to be meek then? To be meek is to place all of your hope in His strength and none of it in yours. To be meek is to have all the power of God at your disposal, but it's only used in His command. Meekness is understanding who He is, who you are, and appreciating the difference. Thank you, Michael Hutchinson. That's meekness. Meekness is going, 
I couldn't do it, but since he's told me to, it will certainly be done. Mm. That's meekness. Mm. Meekness is not thinking that things are achieved because of your intellect. Now, we, we know this in Christianity. But think back to the last problem that hit your life, the last big problem. What was your first reaction? And that will give you a clue. That will give you an idea. Did we fall to our knees and open the word? Did we call a family prayer meeting? Did we declare a fast in our family? Did we ask brothers in the church to join us? Or did we just run to the bank or run to the, the uh, pharmacy? Or did we just run to the phone? See, these things begin to belie where we actually trust in and what we're declaring is the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? This is not to beat us up. I'm telling you it's necessary for us to accurately look at our lives. Some of you, when you hear this, ought to be going... Hey man, I got that one right. I got that right. Yesterday I got a letter from the IRS and instead of panicking and calling everybody I know and getting the CPA on the phone, I fell on the ground and, and called out to the Lord and I received His assurance. Then I called my CPA. Right? Yeah. Some of us are to be getting some of these things right. Who will inherit the land? And is it active or is it passive? I, I When I think about this, I can't help but think about Deuteronomy 1.21. So y'all turn to Deuteronomy 1.21. <clears throat> Active or passive? Tell me when you're there. Okay, two of us are there. Okay, so we're still not there. There? Come on, who's in Deuteronomy 1.21? Give me a hand raise. Deuteronomy 1. The 21st verse. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. How passive is it to trust, delight, and commit to the Lord? It requires you to take action in the path that He has called you in. And did you hear recently, I, see I'm not watching TV these days, and sometimes that's good. They repeat the same news cycle about every 30 minutes, and so they tell you what to think about. Yeah. But if you're only catching it in print, you know what? You're only thinking about the articles you chose to read. Uh, I'm not arguing for or against TV here. I'm just telling you it's a difference in my life lately. Okay? So as I'm reading, one of the articles I found was a commencement speech at a high school. Did anybody else see that? Raise your hand if you saw or heard about a commencement speech. Only one of us. Two of us. I get it. I'm thinking national news media. How does a high school commencement speech make the national news media? You know why? The title of it was, You Are Not Special. I'm not kidding. There is nothing special about you. And the speaker spoke for 12 minutes and 48 seconds to high school seniors about their lack of specialness. I want to give you an expert excerpt for a second. Is that okay? I realize that's a strange thing to say in church. And why would we quote a, a high school commencement speech? Because he has a profound point. Listen to this. He says, so think, this is David McCullough. So think about this. Even if you're one in a million on a planet of 6.8 billion, that means there are nearly 7,000 people exactly like you. Yeah, let that sink in for a while. Fred, this is an English teacher, not a math teacher. But he got it right. Imagine standing somewhere over there on Washington Street on Marathon Monday and watching 6,800 U's go running by. And consider for a moment the bigger picture. Your planet, I'll remind you, is not the center of the solar system. Your solar system is not the center of its galaxy. Your galaxy is not the center of the universe. In fact, astrophysicists assure us the universe has no center. Therefore, high school senior, you cannot be the center of it. <laughs> He got people's attention here for a moment. Why is this such strange speech? Is there anything in it that is not factually accurate? It's strange speech because we're used to heaving accolades on people with absolutely no achievement. We're used to giving everybody a trophy and taking everybody to McDonald's whether they've achieved anything of merit or not. When I was a kid, there was actually a debate whether we should even keep score. So no longer is it how you played the game. No longer is it whether you won or lost. It's simply what's in it for me. Is that a selfish society? Mm -hmm. He goes on. He says, but Dave, you cry. Walt Whitman tells me I'm my own version of perfection. 
Epictetus tells me that I have the spark of Zeus, and I don't disagree. So that makes 6.8 billion examples of perfection. 6.8 billion sparks of Zeus. You see, if everyone is special, then no one is. If everyone gets a trophy, trophies become meaningless. In our unspoken but not so subtle Darwinian competition with one another, which springs, I think, from our fear of our own insignificance, a subset of our dread of mortality, we has of late, we Americans, to our detriment, come to love accolades more than genuine achievement. Oh, friends, tell me that's not true. Tell me that we don't raise up for ourselves teachers that tell us what our itching ears want to hear. And what do we want to hear? You're a champion. That's what we want to hear. We want to hear you are wonderful just like you are. And pastor, there is such pressure on you to tell me this, that if you don't, on your street, there's seven other churches I can choose from. <coughs> Somebody will tell me. So the goal of Christianity then becomes a spiritual safety deposit box where we collect people by telling them what they want to hear and then collecting money from them to do good things. And we no longer care about the actual orphan being fed. We care that we get to tell people that we're feeding orphans. Mm. That's not the work of God. Mm. The first thing they did in Kenya when I showed up was offer to name their church after us. Now that's kind of strange until I drove around. And then I realized every church there is named after some American church. Because that's what's in it for the American church. I said, I would rather you punch me right in the face than name your church after us. That didn't translate well. God gave you this ministry. God birthed this in your heart. I didn't take 14 orphans in my house. I have a heart for him, but I don't have a heart for him from beginning to completion. That's your responsibility, friend. Don't pass it off on me. We each have our leg of this race to run. I'll help you. I won't carry him for you. You understand what I'm getting at? But this points to a deeper problem. Something in us just craves validation. Hmm. The reason that we crave validation is because we're not taking the time to get it from our Father. You know what the problem with craving validation from people is? They could never give you enough. Never. And not enough people could tell you you're pretty. Not enough people could tell you you're an accomplished businessman. There is not enough praise in the world to feed that kind of deficit in a human being. Because God made you to need Him. He made you for that. And if you can't get it from Him, I'm going to tell you something. You can't get it anywhere. So then the question for us becomes, how do we get that from him? Well, I think that this professor has, has hit it on the head. Listen to how he describes it. The fulfilling life, the distinctive life, the relevant life is an achievement, not something that will fall into your lap because you're a nice person or mommy ordered it from the cater. You'll note the founding fathers took pains to secure your inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Quite an active verb, pursuit. Which leaves us, I should think, little time for lying around watching parrots roller skate on YouTube. How are you speaking to high school seniors? They probably all go to church somewhere. <clears throat> the first President Roosevelt, the old rough rider, advocated the strenuous life, and then he goes through the change in our culture where we have moved from meriting achievement to meriting accolades. Have you noticed in our society there are people famous for being famous? Yeah. They didn't make anything. They don't do anything except show up at parties and get paid for being foolish or letting some videotape of them uh, leak out to the public. Right? This is what they're famous for. Is this something to be praised for? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. I'd like to talk to you about the rest of Psalm 37. We can move forward with that joy, I think. I don't remember what I put on it. Okay. As you move through Psalm 37, I want you to understand that those first 11 verses talk about how to inherit the land. You inherit the land when your confidence is in the Lord. You inherit the land when you're pliable in His presence so that He can speak to you and you're not so set in your way that you won't listen. You inherit the, the land when you commit your way. You're rolling in the direction God has pushed you and nothing can move you. 
I put a couple versions of this translation on, on, uh, on your screen. This is Psalm 37. It's verse 23. It says uh, in the NIV, If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his step firm. Here we have the Lord divide, delighting in the man's steps who are firm. Verse uh, 23 in the complete Jewish Bible. Adonai directs a person's steps, and he delights in his way. There we're not sure who's delighting in the way. You follow me? Is it the Lord or is it the man? We see in the King James Version, the steps of a good man, that's not been said in any of the other versions, are ordered by the Lord, and he delighted in his way. The he there, we don't know who it refers to. It's a pronoun without an antecedent for you English lovers. When we see three verses that are fairly different, one of the things that is nice to be able to do in our day and time is to go to the Hebrew. And when we do that, this first word, 3068, uh, you can go back one, no, you got it, is Yahweh. Now, the reason that it looks different than Yahweh, those of you that are looking at the Hebrew letters will notice an additional one on the far right, is because when you make a word like, uh, if you go from Eric to Eric's, so that it is not plural but possessive, we change the endings. They do the same thing in Hebrew. So we have Yahweh or the Lord. Keep going. Next one. Sliding. Moving. <laughs> then in Hebrew, we have this next word, which is mitzvah. It's 4703. This has to do with your course, your way of life, the way that something unfolds. Next one. Then we have gibber. King James translated this a good man. Do y'all recognize the word gibber? I call my son that all of the time. Gibber, gibber doesn't just mean a good man. It means a mighty warrior, a valiant man. It means somebody who is spiritually strong. Let's go to the next one. From gibber, we go to uh, konanu, which has to do with being ordered, established, set up, or made firm. One more. Uh, this is direct. Direct has to do with the course that you're already walking on, being able to look back at it. You can see your direct. One more time. Then all of this results in delight, pleasure, favor, or being pleased with. These are six Hebrew words, friends. Six. Go back to that very first slide with the translations on it. In English, look how many words. In the NIV, we have 13 words to describe those six Hebrew words. In the complete Jewish Bible, we have 11 to describe those six Hebrew words. In the King James Version, 17 words to describe six Hebrew words. Do any of you naturally gravitate towards that King James Version like I did? I naturally gravitate towards it. You know why? Because there's three times as many words in it as there are in Hebrew, which is trying to help you understand the actual meaning of it. Go to the end of this, past the Hebrew words. You know what the uh, K-E-V is? King Eric. King Eric version. <laughs> I, I wanted to figure out how to summarize this. The Lord orders the steps of his valiant man, and the course is one the man is pleased with or has pleasure in. Now, I'm not telling you that I have the authority to retranslate this. I'm not telling you that these people are wrong. I'm telling you that if you study each word, which is not always the best way to translate something, this is kind of what you may come up with. Now let's apply that to what we've learned. Is it valiant to commit your way to the Lord regardless of the consequence? Yes. Is it valiant to disregard what you feel is prudent and be pliable or delight in His way? Yes. Is it valiant to trust in Him when no one else will? Yes. To trust in Him when your heart tells you not to? Friends, it is valiant men, gibber in Hebrew, men who are pleasing to the Lord. But that's not the beauty of the verse, in my opinion. The beauty is, if you'll just show courage, He will bring an order to your path. If you'll just show courage, He will bring a direction to your path. If you'll just show courage in His doing that, ordering your path, no matter where it leads you, you'll delight in it. Come on now, how many people do you know with hard lives that are happy? How many people do you know that did unimaginably difficult things, but they're proud that they did it. Hmm. Come on, this is such as the kingdom. It's what the ancients were commended for. Do you think Enoch's happy that he walked with God when almost no one else did? I think so. Do you think Noah's happy he built that boat? Is that valiant? 
Yes, I think so. You show me a man who made it into the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11 that was not valiant, and I want to challenge that assertion. Were they passive? How many of them sat back and are rewarded for thinking lofty thoughts? None of them. None. None of them were. They all acted in courageous, valiant ways, and they ended up with, with lives that the Lord is pleased of and that they are pleased with. Come on, friends, does this mean they didn't do anything wrong? No. The book of Acts tells us that David is a man after God's own heart. Yes? Anybody yes. disagree with that? Is David proud of every area of his life? No. Of course not. But could he look back at his life and say that he was valiant for the Lord? Yes. yes, he stood up when everybody else laid down, didn't he? I mean, he went to war when everybody else hid in holes. If you want to feel the approval of God, then we have to figure out how to valiantly carry out his word. We have to figure out how to be referred to what the King James calls a good man, what the NIV says, a man that the Lord delights in. And truthfully, the Hebrew says, a spiritually strong man, a warrior. We have to figure out how to do that. Are we going to get that simply by people telling us that we're already there? Probably not, but that is the American way. God bless America. America is the best. It's made in America. If it's made in America, it's better than everywhere else. Why? Why? Because you were paid three times what somebody else was paid to put it together? Why? Because you got twice as many smoke breaks? Why is it better? Well, because we're American. Isn't that another way to say we're entitled? <laughs> See, I would like us to begin to say, Lord, show me those milestones in my life. Show me those areas that I can look back on and know that you're proud of me. Show me the ones that lie ahead that I must conquer so that I can continue to walk in that feeling. See, when we have those, when we can look back and say, I crossed the Jordan. When we can look back and say, I was there when the walls fell. My knees were shaken together, but I did not give up on God. I went forward. I was there the day the entire nation decided to be circumcised at Gilgal. And I didn't run and hide. I stood up and participated. I shed blood for this covenant. When we can do those things, we don't need people to give us accolades. In fact, they can heap upon you arrows. But inwardly, you can smile because you know you have the Lord's approval. Come on, you want to build somebody with strong self-esteem? Teach them to achieve something. Perhaps we should stop rewarding mediocrity. Maybe we could raise the bar high enough that it took some faith to hit it. Yes. And if it took faith and you hit it, guess what you could be proud your life showed? Faith. This is where this ministry is aiming. It's not aiming to beat anybody up. It's not aiming to push anybody down. I started this ministry in a living room by inviting my neighbors and no one Okay, I'd love to say that somebody out here was there, but you weren't, right? There was nothing visible that I could look at and say, oh, the Lord's going to do this. You know what? I can look back and be proud of that achievement because he's done something here. Does that mean I didn't make mistakes? God knows you are all been there these steps of the way. Of course, I make many mistakes still doing it. But I can still be proud that the Lord is achieving something in my life. Isn't that worth something? Mm -hmm. I recently participated in a move. I was so blessed to see so many brothers there. It occurred to me that I was watching a couple at an age where some people are beginning to consider retirement. And they were leaving a house that was paid for. Mm. On a plot of land that was paid for. Surrounded by relatives in a familiar state. To go somewhere that was unfamiliar to something that was not paid for. At a time in people's life when they're looking to coast, these people are putting it back in gear. Amen. And you know what? I began to cry a little bit. And then because we're moving, I wiped it away. Act like it wasn't happening. And say, hey, this is something you should be proud of. Mm. You know? Praise God. I'm glad we can do it in our 20s. That's important. But we have to be able to do it in our 30s and 40s. In 50s, in 60s, and until the day we die, we have to be able to trust the Lord, Amen. to delight in Him, yeah. to commit our way unto Him, or else we should not be proud. We should not receive the accolades that says we're 
princes with God and lay claim to heaven when our deeds do not show it. Now the danger in preaching anything, no matter what it is, we're always craving balance, balance, balance. In reading all of the missionaries, all of the great men of God contained in that library, I can't find a single one that lived a balanced life. I'm just telling you, I can't. They were men of drastic extremes. They were men who polarized whole groups. They were men like John the Baptist, men like Jesus, men like Paul. They were never people that you can strive to live a life of perfect balance and you will accomplish zero. We call it budget neutral. You're neither a deficit nor are you a plus. The Bible speaks about that in a different term. Our goal in our ministry is to provoke people, to arouse it, to encourage it. And you know what? We'll be the first there with you to say, I'll take that step right alongside you. Right? But what we will never do is sit back and say, oh no, you're an absolute special person, a hero, amazing, unique in all the universe because you do exactly what all the lost people do, nothing. We'll never do that. In fact, sometimes it's shaming to read what the lost people do, isn't it? Sometimes the lost people trying to appease their conscience do more than the Christian people who have used the gospel to appease their conscience, but their deeds don't support their acceptance of the gospel. I read a poem this week. I know that surprised I was surprised there wasn't a... <laughs> I read a poem this week. You can move forward in that slide. Oh, no, this is worth here. Men who never make mistakes never make anything else either. That's a quote that came from the book, Lords of the Earth. Don Richardson wrote it. I don't really know who the quote belongs to. I couldn't find it. So I'm going to quote it as him because that's where it came from. I want you to think about it. Men who never make mistakes never make anything else either. Now Albert Einstein said some, some similar things. He said men who never make mistakes never tried anything new. <laughs> right? Are you hearing a theme here? If you're going to trust the Lord, if you're going to step out, you're going to fail. Those failures do not define us. You know what finds, defines us? That we stepped out. That defines us. Because it never depended on your arm, your strength, your wisdom. It depends upon your ability to step out for the Lord. Why do you think he keeps bringing them to river crossings? Or, or ocean crossings? Why do you think he keeps having them face armies that are bigger than them? It's to teach us something. Trust Him. All of the righteousness is in the action that is trusting Him. All of the righteousness, not in your doctrinal perfection. It is in the action that shows you are trusting Him. Why can you say men who never make mistakes never make anything else either and, and say that that's a balanced statement? Is it, is it because my mistakes don't matter? No. It's because I believe Romans 8.28. I believe that since I love him and I'm called according to his purpose, that in all things, even my mistakes, God works for the good of those that love him. If your mistake is motivated by trust, if it was in an attempt to be pliable in his presence, an attempt to roll in the direction he's rolling, he will work it out, friends. He's looking for somebody who will stand at the plate and swing. Did not the prophecies confirm that today? I didn't share this message topic with anybody except Darren. I love Darren. He's the only one in the church I thought would appreciate poetry like I would. And not only did he know it and appreciate it, he also quoted a couple other poems that Kipling wrote. And I'm going to show you that here in a minute. I love to have people in the church smarter than me. It helps me do sermon prep. Right? And people that build things better and people that are stronger and people that are better looking. You want to be surrounded by a community that aspires to something, friends. Not one that aspires to simply sit. Do you understand the difference? Amen. You can sit and say that you're trusting. You can sit and say that you're patient, that you're steady. You are. You're steadily doing nothing. The life that God honors is one that is in step with the Spirit. Now, my step might look different than Charlie's step. might look different than Fred's step. The balance in this is that no one man is the standard. Jesus is the standard. This ministry does not seek to make disciples of its pastors in the sense that your life should look like your pastor in every regard. It makes disciples of Jesus. Your pastors are just examples that are hung out there to say, here's one way it might look. Is that not fair? 
If it's not, then please tell me. Because this is all I got. <laughs> okay. Even if it's not fair, we'll move forward. Rud Rudyard Kipling. And, uh, you know, his name's one of those that if you ask five people how to pronounce, five people pronounce it differently. But according to a British website, this is Rudyard, not Rudyard. So Rudyard Kipling, <laughs> Rudyard Kipling wrote a poem called If. What is really neat about this is this man was born in 1865 and he died in 1936. When I'm telling you about him, understand who his work influenced. This influenced the generations that won World War II. This influenced men like Winston Churchill who would come up on his heels and, and say, never, never give up. Now, I'm not here to extol the virtues of the British Empire. I'm an American and July 4th is around the corner. I take great pride in going to countries that at some point we all threw the British out. I just think it's neat, right? We find a common bond with anybody in the world that drives on the wrong side of the road because now we can say we have something in common. <laughs> The British bring a certain order everywhere they went, and at some point, everybody welcomed them to leave. Okay, go back to your island. But one of the contributions of this man, who was the first English-speaking or English-writing Nobel Peace Prize winner, not Peace Prize, Nobel Literature oh, Prize winner, and the youngest to ever receive it, one of his contributions is what we sometimes call a stiff uh, upper lip. Or, or grit. He defined in a four stanza poem what an ideal man would look like. So, Pastor, I came to church to learn the word. I did not come to sit and listen to poetry. I'm with you. Of course, most of the word is poetry. You may not recognize that because it's not in our native language, but most of the word is poetry. In Song of Songs means of all poems, this is the most excellent poetry. And if there weren't children in here, God would tell you what the subject matter is, right? Uh, God is bold. God is valiant. He's courageous. He shies away from no subject. None. And is unashamed about it because he is the ultimate in the expression of love and truth and faithfulness. So how on earth could we stoop to reading a poem? Because I can see the gospel in it, and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to read this to you because that's not big enough for you to read, huh? Is it big enough for you to read? Yeah. You can? Yeah. Well, praise God, I'll read it and you can follow along. This poem's called If. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting. Or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good, nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to, broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve you your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you. If all men count with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. This poem was held up as the ideal man. Something that little boys, presumably, that would come to rule nations, would read and idealize and think about. But when I hear these words, I think about Jesus. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, is that not the Sea of Galilee? The scripture clearly says, I mean absolutely clearly says, that Jesus was asleep on a cushion. And what is this, did his disciples say to him? Lord, do you want us to drown? They're blaming him. What was he doing to cause this? 
He was asleep on a cushion. He is the epitome of manliness. He is the epitome. When we think about things like twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, hasn't this what the ecclesiastical community has been doing from the beginning? Did they quote Jesus? Did religious people quote Jesus to make a trap for an entire nation? This man says he can tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. Maybe the most exciting part of all of this is what I would call the supernatural building phase. He says, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop to build them up with worn out tools. Did Jesus give us life to build something? Who are the worn out tools that he's using to build it? He looks at a man like Peter and says, blessed are you, Peter, for this was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. You're a rock, and on this rock I build my church. Of course, in the same chapter, what's he also tell? Get behind me, say. Was Peter a worn out tool? Yeah, and how long would he last? 60, 70 years? How long would he last? Risking it all on one turn of pitch and toss. Losing and never breathing a word about your loss. How many generations has God invested everything in? I mean, invested it all. And they didn't raise up godly children for the next generation. So it's like it was lost and they had to start again. The supernatural building phase in anyone's life is, is an amazing thing, is it not? If you were the king of the universe, you would not have entrusted the plan of salvation to a, a teenage, unwed, uh, pregnant mother, would you? But he did. You would not have entrusted it to weak human flesh, but he did. And then having had that superman, that perfect fullness of the deity, come and accomplish all God's will, would you have left that work in the disciples' hands after three years of training? Come on, those of you that have been alive a while, you, you know three years is just long enough to learn what you don't know. Yeah. Would you have done that? In each generation that goes by, could you stand by and watch your words twisted to make war? Could you stand by and watch the things that people would do in your name? Throw oil on cars and claim them, right? Use your precious gospel you died for as a means to extort money from people? To serve your turn long after they're gone and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says hold on? There's something in you that was in Jesus that says, the prince of this world's coming for me, but he has no hold on me. The world's going to learn through this difficult feat that I love the Father. Parents? Exactly what Hello. Said. They come in pairs called zugits. That's not a restaurant guy. I mean, it is in the States, but in Hebrew, zugits are anointed teachers who, who offer opposing points of view so that people might see the totality of the truth. Right? It wasn't balanced. It wasn't on this hand this and on this hand this. They were diametrically opposed to each other. Sometimes they got mad at each other and called each other houses of Satan. Yeah. They did. That kind of competition somehow was good for the nation. I'm not a fan of denominations, but I do love when different denominations get together to debate something. You know what? You find out they're all wrong and that's useful. <laughs> and you find out what they're right about. I'm not in the camp that says, let's line up everything we disagree about and eliminate it, and, and let's just focus on what we can agree on. That's how you get to universalism. I just think it's ridiculous, ridiculously, wickedly sinful. But I do like the clashing of ideas, of revelation. Sometimes, what we're saying in this ministry is not so much that this is God's will for every person on the earth, we're simply saying, this is what the Lord has shown us His will is for us. This is who we are. So, well, I don't think it's very balanced. I don't think John the Baptist was very balanced, but it was still God's will for his life. Are you hearing me? So I'm, I'm actually inviting you to join us in our lunacy. <laughs> to come get out of balance with us. Every once in a while, the pendulum of history tilts the wrong way. Right now, it's tilting towards accolades rather than achievements. So I'm going to risk the whole discussion on faith and deeds and the grace and the merits of the cross and, and credited righteousness and all of those things with out-of-balance statements that say, get off your salvation and do something or you're not saved. And that doesn't bother me at all. God put it in my heart to do it. 
It does not, I don't find it irresponsible. I don't find it bad or wrong or feel the need to apologize for it. I'm telling you, if you can't see fruit in your life, you need to look at your life. And if you have to award yourself fruit where it cannot be seen, it is not fruit. Having the trophy does not mean that you won the game these days. You need to look and see if you have God's trophy. You say, well, all my life I went to church, I tried to raise good kids. How is that fruit? You're describing your intentions. That is not fruit. You know what fruit looks like? When you can say, hey, this young man stood under great duress and he did not renounce Jesus. Not for a moment. I'm very proud of a couple friends I have that made it well into adulthood and stayed virgins. That's rare today, isn't it? Charlie told me a story about uh, an Olympic athlete here recently. 29 years old. She's not famous for winning medals. She's famous because at 29, she's still a virgin and says so. Can you imagine how sick it is that that's rare? I mean, how strange that is that that's rare. But that's fruit. It's fruit when we can point to deeds that display our trust. It is not fruit to point to good intentions. Somewhere it said that the road to hell is paved with those. Are you all in John 13? Yes. <laughs> it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He showed them the full extent of his love. What did he go on to do, friends? Wash their feet. Why didn't he just say, I love you so much? I love you a bunch. I love you a lot. <laughs> Why did he do that? He took an extreme action. The king of the universe fell on his knees and performed the lowest task in the room. You read the rest of the chapter, he then looks at them and says, you would be blessed if you go do these things. Now that I have washed your feet, you are blessed if you do them, not if you believe it was a good thing to do. See, we're always trying to evoke in you the desire to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what next right thing can I dare for you? And you know what? Sometimes, sometimes it is so terrifying to take a small step. Some of the hardest things I've done in my life are not give away thousands of dollars and not give away cars, and I've done both. Sometimes it's simply to call someone I would rather not have to talk to. My finger, look, I mean, I'm not nearly as strong as a lot of people in the church, but I, I don't usually tremble, Mike, when I dial. My finger shook. My voice cracked. My mind's telling me there's no reason to do this. You're fine with them. They're fine with you. Leave well enough alone. But the valiant thing is to trust that the reason it keeps coming to your mind is the Lord wants you to deal with it. The pliable thing to delight in the Lord would be to say, maybe the framework I'm trying to shove this into is wrong. Maybe it's not yet dealt with and I just keep trying to give myself the accolade that it has been dealt with. Maybe then I could feel the overwhelming weight that God was rolling and roll with him rather than be crushed by him. So I picked up the phone and called, right? You find out that there is great uh, approval in the Holy Spirit when you do something that's hard for you to do. Now, you could be sitting out there right now saying, it's hard for Eric to make a phone call. It's not hard for me at all. Well, rest assured then that's not what God will ask you to do. He will ask you to do whatever is hard for you to do. And we cannot measure my ministry against Caitlin's and Caitlin's against JJ's based on how we compare to each other. We are not the standard. The reason I read you that poem by Kipling is because Jesus is the standard. He's the only one that's ever lived up to it. He is that perfect human being. Everybody else, if you're honest when you read it, will realize that all men count with you and sometimes some count too much. You realize that sometimes when everybody loses their head about you, you lose yours too. You realize that sometimes when lied about, you've been tempted to deal in a lie too. You will find that everything that the man extols, he extols because the opposite was in him and this is something he was yearning for. 
It's the ideal of what we want to be. And that ideal is found in Christ. What I admire most is how difficult it was for him to offer his life in the garden. It was so difficult that he was crushed. It was so difficult that he sweat as if it were drops of blood. That's not an easy thing to do, friends. Anybody in here ever done it? But we feel comforted in the fact that we know it was done. You might even know the medical condition that can cause it. You might even know the spot in which it happened. You have to be a 4th century Roman to know that, right? A psychic who's the mother of an emperor. But you know what it is to be in the crushing weight of that olive press? When everything in you wants to do anything other than what he's telling you to do, and you do it. Because when you know that, you can be excited. You can feel that Holy Ghost affirmation, that pat on the back that you can never get from Botox, Amen. that you could never get from a new suit, you can never get from a promotion. You can feel as if all of heaven is smiling upon you, and the great cloud of witnesses that encircles you sees you as worthy to be in their number. Amen. Amen. Come on, saints. That's worth something. Now, if what you hear me standing here saying is that you don't have this, you're not listening carefully. I'm saying it's worth everything to get it, to keep getting it, and to get more after that. I'm not saying you don't have it. I don't know you well enough to know what's hard for you. I mean, some of you I do. Some is hard just to walk in here today. You weren't sure how you'd be received. Some, it's hard to walk in here because it's new. Some, it might be hard to walk in here because most of the people are a different color than you. Some, it might be hard because you're from a different place. I don't know. I know this. There is no reward if our trust does not cause us to push through the hard things. That's what I know. I know that this caused a man named David Livingstone in 1878 to issue a call to the whole world. Send me your young men, he said. He was crossing the continent of Africa for the very first time. He was facing slave traders. He was facing malaria. He even got attacked by a lion. One of the responses that went down in history was a Bible society that we should not name. He said, if you found good roads to where you are, we think we should like to send you young men. He wrote back to them famously. It was reported all over the world. If the men you intend to send will only come if there's good word, roads, keep them. Men heard that call. They went out all over the world and they looked for the hardest task that they could possibly do. One of those men that so touched my life, a great explorer for the gospel, is Stanley Albert Dale. I want to tell you a little bit about him for a second. He was moved by Kipling, and that's how I learned of Kipling. Not being classically educated myself, the way that I learn anything that I know is to read. And if you don't love to read, friends, you are so missing out on life. YouTube does not contain life secrets. It just doesn't. You know, our sitcoms will not feed your soul. Having your feet washed by somebody you don't know will not feed your soul. Having your back rubbed by some stranger will not feed your soul, neither will a new haircut, neither will a new suit. What feeds our soul is when we dare to trust God for something that we could never trust Him for or, or trust ourselves for. Step out. This man did this. He was a weakling, a self-described weakling. It's hard not to think of the old Captain America. It said that when he first was acquainted with Kipling, he was in junior high. He stood up in class to read the poem, If, and spitballs hit him in the back of the neck, and people began to snicker at his small frame. And he saw in the poem of Kipling an ideal man that he would like to be. So he set himself to push-ups and sit-ups, and he began running, and he began taking outlandish dares. He tried to swim across Sydney Harbor one time. All carnal ways to prove that he was a man. His father was an alcoholic and called him a weakling regularly. His mother was a dreamer and oh, no earthly good. His siblings didn't understand him any more than the rest of the world did. But somebody gave him a book in his late teenage years about Jesus. And he made the connection. 
Jesus is the kind of man I want to be. He risked it all. He entrusted himself to worn out tools. He cared about everybody, but he didn't care so much as to be distracted from what God called him to do. Some would call that balance. I would call it extreme. An extreme sense of destiny. As he got born again, the church quickly became uncomfortable with Stanley. He began preaching on street corners, just like Matthew and I did. They were happy with that. Call out those sinners, sin! The problem is he turned on the groups that he was with, too. He was not content to point to the man who was going to the bar that knew he was a sinner. He began to point to the others who were standing with him who thought it best to live in two worlds at one time. That did not earn him the admiration of his peers. They began to say ugly things about him, but he was comforted. People said ugly things about Jesus. He applied to a missionary society after World War II, after having been a commando in the Australian Army. By the way, his chief complaint when he was a commando in the Australian Army was that when he saw the Brits and saw the Americans, because he was stationed in New Guinea, where the Japanese were making an advance, he was disappointed that they had jam for their bread, they had flush toilets. It seemed that they were living a life of luxury on the front line to him. He found that disgusting. You could dislike a man like that. You could dislike a man that simply did not like your comfort. He saw it as a distraction from what you were there to do. While he's in New Guinea, he looks out into the hills and another poem comes to him. I wish it was just scripture, but he always related the scripture to poems. For instance, the poem, If, when it ends uh, at the end of that poem about the earth and everything in it is yours, he saw that as Psalm 24. He saw it as the Lord and the earth and everything in it is the Lord's. This next poem he quotes says, Till a voice as bad as conscience rang intermittently, uh, cha I'm sorry, interminably changes. I'm butchering it. Till a voice as bad as conscience rang interminably changes. In one everlasting whisper, day and night repeated so. Something hidden, go and find it. Go and look behind, behind the ranges. Something lost behind the ranges. Lost and waiting. Go. When he was a commando but in love with the Lord, he looked out into those mountains and he felt as if something was hidden. A scripture rose in his heart. A scripture very much like Proverbs 26, where it says it is to the glory of God to conceal the matter, to the glory of kings to search it out. And he began to have a noble ideal in his heart. Somebody needs to go. There are people out there that haven't heard. He had the words of Livingstone ringing in his ears. Of course, he had his relatives and everybody else that said he was crazy and an adventurer seeker and out of balance. So he applies to a missionary society. They don't send him there. They send him somewhere else. And while he's there, he spends four years. He translates the book of Mark into a tongue that nobody had ever seen before. But while he's doing that, other missionaries come and go. And some of them say things like, this is a hard man. He's not suited for pastoring. Pastors are supposed to be gentle. Pastors are supposed to be sweet. This guy, he's, he's rigid and he's disciplined. So the Bible Society sends him a letter. It takes a month to get there. When it arrives, he's baptizing his first seven converts and had just penned the last words of the book of Mark in a tongue never before written. And he was fired. I'm sure he made mistakes. Of course, men who don't make mistakes don't do anything else either. The writer of the book notes... All seven men finished their life in the faith. All seven men accomplished amazing things. Nobody liked his methods, but they did like the result, at least for those seven men. Of course, on the island, there were lots more men than those seven. So the argument always goes, you could reach the masses if you just did it differently. Is that how Jesus did it, Spence? Did he work to reach the masses? Or did he work to reach the remnant? See, there are some that will rise to this occasion. So... Undeterred, the man applies to another missionary society, really worried because if they check his references from the first, they're not going to hire him. But, as luck would have it, providence would have it, they didn't check his missionary references. So here he goes, somewhere no one's ever been. He builds a church, literally from the ground up. He fills it with people. 
And you guessed it, other missionaries who came and visited his work said, this is a hard man. He disciplines people in a way that is... He treats them like soldiers and acts as if life and death is on the line. Hmm. So the missionary society fired him and gave his work to someone else. But then he got sent to Indonesia, Brent. He got sent to an area that today is uh, Irangira. It used to be called Dutch New Guinea. This was a third missionary society who said this guy obviously has some problems, but he's also somebody who seems to want to get something done. First thing that he had to do was build a landing strip. This was a task that usually took a couple weeks. After 10 months and appendicitis and inclement weather and everybody they sent him quit on him except one. He finished the landing strip. Usually two weeks. For him, it was ten and a half months. By the way, he's building a landing strip in the center of a tribe that wears bones through their nose. Their undergarment is a singular wooden structure. That you probably know where the men wear it. Supported by a string. The women are completely unclothed except a small grass tuft that just covers their genitals. And they eat people. They like to eat people. And the first thing that they notice about this man is they've never seen flesh that they thought would taste as good as that lily white flesh. What special kind of man must this be? It's like a gift from heaven, food. The only reason they didn't eat him is because he was the boldest human being they'd ever seen. He crossed the river with his Bible above his head walked over to hundreds of warriors, said, I'm going to build a landing strip right there in my house right there because the gospel's coming to your tribe today. Now, they were not, not intimidated by him. They were curious. What kind of audacious, pint-sized fellow is this? We could kill him and eat him, but we'd rather watch and see what he does. We're curious. His, his working buddy was a man named Bruno. And Bruno was not like him. He was not brash. He did not swim the river first. He was meditative. He was thoughtful. Sometimes Bruno and Stanley, they clashed. Stanley would later say that that was the grinding stone that was forging the image of Christ in his life. And when everyone else left him, you know who didn't? Bruno. When he had appendicitis, Bruno did not, the methodical, patient, loving, kind, Bruno left, did, would not leave aside and he prayed for him until he got healed. But none of those reasons are the reasons that people remember. By the way, he completed the runway project, not because of shovel power. He was angry. He was standing in a rainstorm. All of the other missionaries had left. He shook his fist into the clouds and said, Devil, you will not stop me. Listen to me, Satan. I claim this territory in the name of Jesus and if everybody gives up I will not give up and I will not quit he saw the wind and the rain as an enemy until he realized he was eroding the cliff face all around him and mud was sliding down into the valley he had to create a runway in and it filled it in you ever heard of faith that moves mountains it might just be a holy ghost grit and a tenacity that moves mountains I heard one popular Hebraic teacher say that what faith really is is chutzpah, Holy Ghost backbone. What the world remembers Stanley Albert Dale for was September 25th, 1968, with his wife Pat and four children there. The tribes that he was witnessing Jesus to had had enough. He had burned down their idols. He had dismantled their temples. He had converted their children. A sizable portion of the population was now believers. And the priest of a demonic god named Kiribu had had enough. See, these Yali warriors, they like to shoot arrows. And the more arrows that were in a pig that they killed, the greater the feat. 
So it was not uncommon that long after a pig was dead, you would keep shooting arrows into it until it looked more like a porcupine, because then when you carry back this trophy or accolade, you'll have to decide which. It was more glorious because it was that hard to kill the pig. Well, when they shot Stanley with the first arrow, he kept walking, pulled it out, and he still spoke to him about Jesus. And when they shot him with the second arrow, he kept walking, he pulled it out, and he kept speaking to them about Jesus. And he did this with the first ten arrows, and then the next ten, and then the next ten. When he finally fell on the ground, sixty arrows lay at his feet. Because he possessed that unique quality. This says run with perseverance the race that's going to count for you. And the tribesmen were so taken back that the first thing they did was dismember his body because they were scared that a man that was possessed with this kind of supernatural power would probably raise from the dead one day. Hmm. The second thing that they did was begin to tell the story and it spread among the tribes people about a supernatural man who would rise from the dead one day that could not be stopped by 60 arrows. So two years later, even the men that killed him were converted because a valiant man delighted in the steps that God had ordered for him, even though they were hard. Though others criticized him, he was driven by the sense to need to achieve something for the Father. That was the goal. Today, there's no monuments around the world for men like Stanley Albert Dale. But there's a monument in the heavens. There's a monument in the heavens because he didn't just walk this race. He ran it. He wasn't dissuaded when others said that he couldn't. He simply said, made some mistakes, but I will accomplish it. Most recently, we've heard a man named Reinhard Bunker share his experience with the Lord. He said something in the 90s like, Lord, I may not have been your first choice, but I'll do a first class job. He got that from Stanley Albert Dale who said, Lord, I may not be the man for the job, but if others won't do it, please consider sending me. Mm. He wanted to spend his life in the service of the Lord. How do you want to spend your life? Well, Eric, you always talk about martyrdom, and you're always talking about these things. I live here. I live in the real world. I still have to change diapers. I still have to do these things. What is the next hard thing that the Lord's put before you that you can do and be proud of? You might be praying for somebody at work. You might be sharing the gospel. It might be intervening in something that your mind says you have no business getting involved in, but your spirit compels you to. Come on. Men of this very same generation are quoted as saying, all that has to happen for evil to prevail is good men do nothing. How many good men are in this room? My heart's desire is that somehow, some way, through word, through deed, through example, we might encourage a church that actually wants to put into deeds the creeds that we sing about. Men who want to not only go to the ends of the earth, but support those that do. Some of you can never step on foreign soil. We know this. For some of you, it has simply never happened. And for some of you, it may not even be God's will for it to happen. But everybody has to spend something for the Great Commission. And it happens every day. We make choices every day. I want to spend my life in the service of the Great Commission. Because I'm convinced that Jesus said to follow him, I needed to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. If you received a different message than that, I think you should check to see if you started at the starting line. Because these are our forefathers. This is the cloud of witnesses we're surrounded by. Men who risked it all. And I aspire to be in their number. And I'm encouraged by you when I see you with the same aspiration. And if you have no desire for it, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be patient, everything else. If you simply have no desire, then you're either not in the race or we're not in the race. One or the other. We'll let you judge that. But I pray that you're moved by the Spirit of God to answer that call. There's got to be greatness in you. Why else would he have saved you? There's got to be something amazing. 
Our last scripture we quote all of the time, so I will simply paraphrase it. It comes from Ephesians 2, and it speaks of Him saving you by faith as an act of grace, not that you should boast. It goes on to say that you're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which He prepared in advance for you to do. Stanley Albert Dale found his good works. David Livingstone found his good works. John G. Patton found his good work. Brother Yoon found his good work. What is your good work? And how many arrows will you have to pull out to get it done? I'm convinced that I'll pull out as many as I have to to get it done. What is your shield of faith for, friends? Is it a trophy? Is it an accolade? What is it? <coughs> It's there for those fiery darts so that you're undissuaded in what God called you to do. Stand to your feet.